In the last couple of videos, we spent a lot of time talking about the chemical synapse, and I don't want to mislead you to think that that's the only type of synapse that there, there is. And so in this video, we're going to be going through different types of synapses in addition to the chemical synapses, and just getting a feeling for the complexity of the subject of synapses and all the different ways in which different neurons can be talking to each other that is not the canonical way that we typically think of in the chemical synapse. So, the first difference is that in addition to the chemical synapse, we have what's called the electrical synapse. We said earlier that these cells are not actually connecting with each other, and I uh, kind of fudged a little bit because sometimes they do, right? So in the chemical synapse, we have a presynaptic cell and a postsynaptic cell that are actually separate cells. They're plasma membranes, their cell membranes are not touching at any particular time, and no electrical activity is directly passing through this synapse here. All of these things are not really true in the electrical synapse. There are these electrical synapses where the two sides of the cell, where the presynaptic and the postsynaptic cell, are actually gathered and held together by what are called gap junctions. And these gap junction channels are semi-permanent protein channels through which ions can flow. Okay? These, are not, these are not ion channels, in which case something's either open or not. I mean, there is basically a continuous between the intracellular space of these two cells because they're held together by these gap junction, gap junction channels. So in the electrical synapse, if you think about what's happening here, is that rather than the you know 100 microseconds or so it might take for a action potential to cause something to happen in the postsynaptic side, in the electrical synapse, it is instantly, it is nearly instantaneous. All you need is for the action potential to basically directly propagate across that synapse in order for that to happen. So in terms of pros and cons, you might want to have an electrical synapse when you want something to happen really, really quickly and very reliably. On the other hand, the trade-off is that you really don't get to change that synapse very much because everything is held together in a very structural, pretty permanent way. We spent the last video talking a lot about ionotropic and metabotropic receptors and different things that can happen on the postsynaptic side. All of that means that you have a whole lot of control over the downstream consequences of this synapse by just modulating the nature and the numbers of all of these receptors in the postsynaptic side. Lots and lots of different things can happen here. It's a very flexible chemical synapse. The, ke the ke electrical synapse, on the other hand, is very fast, but you can't change it very much. And so it's not nearly as flexible, and you probably don't want to use it if you want to use the synapse for things like learning and association. So axons <laughs> can uh, terminate at synapses. And generically speaking, we talked about in the previous couple of lectures about how generically speaking, axons terminate at dendrites, and that's how they receive inputs, and then dendrites sum all that information, they go to the axon hillock, initiate another action potential, and that is generically what happens. But the axon to dendrite synapse is also not the only way you can make a synapse. So that is what's called an axodendritic synapse, axon to dendrite synapse. You can also have what's called an axosomatic synapse, where the synapse, the axon directly synapses onto the soma cell body of the postsynaptic cell. You can even synapse onto the axon of another cell. You can have an axoaxonal synapse. All of these configurations are possible. And if you think about the geometry of action potentials and depolarizations, the hyperpolarizations, propagating through the electrical neuron, you can think about cases where each of these configurations will be desirable depending on the computation you want to happen between the postsynaptic cell and the presynaptic cell. We're going to zoom in a little bit, though, on the axodendritic synapse because that I think that is like the most textbook synapse that everyone learns about, so we're going to learn about it too. So this is a zoomed-in picture of the dendrite. And the first thing you'll notice about it is that it is not smooth. It is not well approximated as a smooth cylinder. In fact, if you zoom in, you'll see that it has these little blubby, blobby things that are coming off of it. These are dendritic spines, and dendritic spines are, are postsynaptic terminals onto which the presynaptic axon terminals will actually make that synapse. And so it is through these structures that then have a localized environment. These spines are formed because instead of then forming a uh, synapse of a axon onto a cylindrical part, of the, of the dendrite, you form the synapse onto these spine structures, which allows the postsynaptic cell to quickly modulate things like how big that spine is. If you enlarge the size of the spine, you enlarge the synapse, and you can have more proteins there that are receptors. You can also modulate the local environment, the local electrical, as well as the local chemical environment at the spine in a way that does not quickly affect all of its neighbors.
Okay, so that's those are spines, and they're super cool, and you can actually watch them change in size in, in real time, doing some experiments uh, that we may talk about a little bit later. So to review, here are the different steps of the chemical synapse that we talked about earlier. And one of the things that we talked about is that when sodium enters the, post the postsynaptic cell, it depolarizes. The synapse is called excitatory. And when chloride enters the postsynaptic cell and it hypopolarizes, we call that synapse inhibitory. So we can think about the way this adds together. Let's just like look back on this diagram and just look at it for one more time, okay? We have here a bunch of dendrites that receive inputs. These inputs can be excitatory or can be inhibitory. In the case, they're either depolarizing or they're hyperpolarizing. All of them propagate according to the cable equations through the dendritic tree. Okay, they're added together and the summed, positive and negative inputs both. And if the sum passes some crucial threshold, then the neuron fires an active potential and becomes active. I'll say this a couple of different ways because this is a really crucial concept here. If the addition if the sum of all of the inputs does not pass a threshold, the cell does not fire, and so nothing happens. Right? There's no record of having a small net input. Nothing happens. Conversely, the neuron can only fire action potentials so fast. There is a limit to how fast it can fire action potentials because the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels need time to recover and for the local electrical gradient of the respective ions to recover to their to resting concentrations before an action potential can be generated again. So a neuron is a device that sums inputs, positive and negative. It passes it through a threshold because below that threshold nothing happens. And there's also a ceiling to its activity because it just physically and physiologically cannot fire very much faster than that. And that leads us back to the problem of the mind-body problem and dualism, where philosophically speaking, for hundreds and thousands of years, people have thought about the fact that maybe your mind and yourself is different than the physics of your body the physical instantiation of your body. And that leads to this idea of the ontological question, are mental states and physical states distinct? And the causal question of how do physical states and mental states influence each other? Is it one directional? Is it both directional? And if so, how? Okay, this is a question that was around for a long time. The process of addition, summation, and thresholding that we talked about in the previous slide essentially killed dualism. And this happened by uh, the seminal, uh, this, uh, this very influential paper in 1943 by McCulloch and Pitts. And they were the first to articulate this idea that you can think of the activity of neurons as a computational logical machine. This sounds obvious to us now because we all talk about how minds are like machines, how your brain's like a, a computer, right? So the analogy is very popular now. Everyone's heard of it by this point. But the 1940s, this is a brand new idea. This is the first time has anyone has ever thought about the equivalency of the electrical activity that we have been observing doing experiments in neurons and the fact that it can actually perform logical operations in the same way that you can compute logical operations either in abstraction and mathematics or in logical machines. And the intellectual history of how we got from this moment in 1943 and the, and the, and the idea of the calculus of the mind and there's a direct path between that idea and artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms as they affect us now in 2023. So this is a topic of a future lecture. I'm looking forward to digging a lot more into it, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> we have the necessary components now to give you a preview of what that's all about. So I'm gonna draw this following diagram here, which is kind of like the same diagram we drew of the neuron, but now in artificial neural network speak. So the inputs here, I'm gonna line them up. These are input cells, just like we have those input cells forming excitatory and inhibitory synapses on the previous diagram, the dendrites. They're either excitatory or inhibitory, in which case there's a W vector here that, that is uh, the encapsulation of to what extent those synapses are positive or negative and by how much. The cell then sums them up, this artificial neural network, this artificial neural neuron sums them up just like the real neuron does. If it doesn't pass a threshold, nothing happens, just like the neuro real neuron. 
And in especially in historical uh, versions of these artificial neural networks, there was also a ceiling above which the cell cannot fire faster. In other words, every single part of an artificial neural network, this neuron model is the basis of all modern artificial neural networks. And these ideas came directly from our knowledge decades ago of how real neurons worked. So we're going to be digging into a lot more about this and thinking about how we got from a knowledge of neurons and the fact that we have action potentials to these simple artificial neural networks to things like uh, ChatGPT and Dolly and Imagine and all of these generative networks that are walking around on our phones right now. We're going to be talking about in the future lecture. But for now, though, we're going to go back to synapses um, because we're talking about exceptions here. So these are all exceptions that are not at all in artificial neural networks, OK? They are in reality. They're in biology. But um, you can program them in. It's possible to instantiate artificial neural networks that have these properties. But um, it's unclear if they'll actually be helpful. And they're certainly more complicated. And so people haven't really, it hasn't become popular yet, although people have tried it in the field of neural warfare computing to implement different versions of more complicated synapses. So we talked about the chemical synapse, right? So it's good. We talked about the electrical synapse. They are not also exclusive. It is possible to have a mixed synapse that is partially chemical and partially electrical. This happens. You can also have what's called a heterosynaptic collection, where one postsynaptic terminal, one postsynaptic spine, for example, can receive both a chemical synapse from one cell and a gap junction electrical synapse from a different cell. And you can also have things like the following, where you have the goldfish mix synapse, where you have a mixture of chemical synapses, electrical synapses, as well as neuromodulation by some other cell that's kind of in the facility, just sprinkling neurotransmitters in your direction. All of these things are observed and have function in different systems, in different nervous systems, and they're really interesting to think about. So I just want to, I don't want to dwell on the details here and look at all the different examples of which there are many, right? I'm a, as a biologist, I am a lumper, not a splitter, but I did want to point out that like lots of lovely things in biology, oftentimes um, there's no hard and fast rules of, oh, something can't happen. If you can kind of articulate it, it's very likely that somebody has found at least an example of that somewhere. And that is the case in these different types of synapses. So we also talked about um, glutaminergic cells and, and GABAergic cells as being excitatory cells and inhibitory cells in the, in, in the, in the central nervous system in mammals. Um, there is a principle that came to be known as Dale's principle, named after neuroscientist Henry Dale, but it was actually articulated by a different neuroscientist, John Eccles. And as phrased by Eccles, Dale's principle is the following. The same chemical neurotransmitter is released by all chemical terminals of the neuron. In other words, one neuron, one neurotransmitter. Every neuron has its own neurotransmitter. It only speaks in language of that neurotransmitter. That's Dale's principle. As it is stated in the following way, in this particular way, it is quite demonstrably false. There are very well-studied examples of co-transmission and dual transmission of one neuron packing different neurotransmitters in the same vesicles and releasing them at the same time. And you can also have co-transmission, where the same presynaptic cell packs totally different vesicles with different neurotransmitters and also release them at the same time. These are all things that we have observed in special systems, and they have really cool functions as well. So I recommend you read uh, some review articles if this is of interest to you. And so even so, I want to emphasize that these things do exist. However, we still talk about glutaminergic neurons and GABAergic neurons because that is the preponderance of the case. And it's still a shorthand that's really convenient if we're thinking about excitation and inhibition in the nervous system. So to summarize, uh, we talked about different types of synapses. There are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. One of them is more flexible, a little bit slower. The other one is faster, but less flexible. It can't really change all that easily. Synapses can be found in many different parts of the cell. You can synapse onto dendrites, somas, axons. Basically, every part of the cell is a potential target for a synapse. So the cartoon picture of all of the inputs coming in the dendrites, that's not quite correct either. As we talked about in the propagation of, of potential, electrical potentials down the cell, the location of the synapse actually has a pretty in big impact on its function. If the synapse is far away from the axon hillock, then it has a really far away to travel before it influences the, that all or nothing action potential initiation event. But if your synapse is much closer, like if it's synapsing directly onto the cell body and you have a big, strong inhibitory synapse, then that synapse has a disproportionate vote, not only because of its size, but because of its proximity and geometry with respect to the, to the site of action potential localization initiation.
We then talked about the overall function of a synapse, which is determined by a variety of different factors. In this case, we talked about how neurotransmitters are released by the presynaptic cell, so it's whether or not it is a, it is a excited, it tend to be a typically excitatory, typically inhibitory neurotransmitter, and also the receptors that are present on the postsynaptic cell. I know I've said this before, but it's super duper important, so you're gonna hear me say it multiple times. Synapses can also be a mixed type, so it doesn't have to be only a chemical synapse or electrical synapse. And you can even have synapses that release multiple different types of neurotransmitters. Even so, we still persist in saying that neurons are identified by the neurotransmitters they release. And so if you see that there is a, um, a neurotransmitter that a, that a neuron releases primarily glut glutamine as a neurotransmitter, we can call that a glutaminergic neuron. So that, that terminology is something that will persist in using for the rest of these lectures.